Hello and welcome. I'm Adi Keo, Editor-in-Chief of the AMA Journal of Ethics. Thank you for joining us for this video edition of Ethics Talk. So why would a reasonable person choose not to take a vaccine that could protect them against a deadly disease? As healthcare workers are among the first being offered vaccines against COVID-19, we're going to explore this pressing question with Dr. R. Kaplan, head of the Division of Medical Ethics at New York University School of Medicine. Art, welcome back to Ethics Talk. Thank you for having me. So despite their increased occupational risk, upwards of 40% of healthcare workers in some hospitals have chosen not to be vaccinated against COVID-19. It may be that some are distrustful, skeptical because the vaccines have only been authorized by the FDA for emergency use. Can you help our audience, some of whom would not hesitate to get the COVID vaccine, understand why some healthcare workers would choose not to get vaccinated? Well, let me begin by saying I am strongly pro-vaccination and I myself have had uh, at least my first shot. Uh, so I'm uh, absolutely in the camp that says vaccination against COVID is, COVID is the prudent thing to do. That said, we have done studies at NYU of vaccine resistance prior to COVID, flu vaccine, other vaccines. Uh, and we found uh, some patterns that extend into COVID. Women in the workforce, healthcare uh, workers, tend to be worried about fertility and pregnancy. They just worry about it. It's, it's understandable that they're concerned, and they are. They say these vaccines have not been tested adequately on pregnant women. I think still we know it's better to get vaccinated against viral diseases when you're pregnant than not, because it can harm the fetus. But nonetheless, that's a concern. You also see people saying, look, I'm uh, not in need of a vaccine. I've been exposed to the flu. I've been exposed to COVID. I'm a frontline worker. It's probably my fifth exposure. I'm sure I have antibodies. Well, they don't actually know whether they've been exposed. They haven't been tested. And they don't know how long the antibodies might last. Vaccines would still be prudent. But there is this line of thinking. By the way, you also see it among first responders, firemen, and police. The last reason, interestingly enough, that we hear is that the vaccine was rushed. You don't get that as much on flu, but you do get it with COVID. People hear warp speed. They hear that the president pushed to get these vaccines approved and was trying to arm twist, and they don't like that. They worry that corners were cut, studies were uh, stopped uh, prematurely to give emergency use, and it makes them nervous. So uh, reflecting on what you've just said, it seems that no one is immune to uh, bad information, even among highly trained healthcare professionals. Given that the public relies on the advice of professionals like physicians and nurses, how should health professions such as nursing and medicine address vaccine hesitancy among its members? Well, I think you're right. Bad information is out there, incomplete information, and sometimes it's stoked up by people who've made a career out of opposing all vaccines. They're all over the internet too. I don't think the healthcare workforce is as amenable to anti-vax propaganda, but you know it's omnipresent, so it could be corroding some of the trust that uh, healthcare workers have in vaccination. So I think there are some things that can be done though. First, I do think institutions need to spend more time educating the healthcare workforce, not assuming that they're gonna know what's best, more webinars, more seminars, more uh, uh, educational activities and outreach to say, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, but this is why we're certain that vaccination is better. I also think it's important to monitor uh, the social media anti-vax websites just to see what's going on out there. And I think professional organizations, Infectious Disease Society, AMA, 
any number of groups that uh, American Academy of Pediatrics that people turn to for reliable information, they should say, we've seen, for example, a lot of stuff on the internet about fertility and it's bogus. There's nothing to worry about. The current vaccines aren't going to get in your DNA. They can't modify anything in your embryo or your child. It may seem unnecessary to say that, but it is necessary to say that. And I think using spokespersons that can appeal to communities that are concerned. What I mean there is, if you have a strong minority workforce getting the right spokesperson to speak up and address concerns that might be there, not because they're different, but just because there's a more there's more trust sometimes in someone who seems to be a peer than someone who seems to be perhaps, and I'll indict myself here, a gray bearded old expert uh, telling you what to do. So sometimes peer to peer, age group to age group, culture to culture, uh, diversity to diversity, I think that helps get the message listened to. Yeah. So at a time when we need all hands on deck in dealing with the devastating health impacts of COVID-19, firing healthcare workers who refuse to get vaccinated because of violating terms of employment would have serious unintended consequences. So uh, how should employers like hospitals and long-term care facilities that need to establish a safe work environment address healthcare workers that, as you alluded to earlier, is a diverse group of people with different backgrounds and experiences with the healthcare system. How do we address those who do not want to get vaccinated? You know, it's a great uh, problem and, and I'm glad you brought it up. We There are small numbers of people who even worry about things like, are vaccines acceptable to vegetarians? Are vaccines acceptable because maybe they have fetal cells in them and you hear some religious objection or pork products I've heard. So these are tiny, tiny uh, percentages of people, but nonetheless, how you respond to them becomes important both because others are watching and as you said, Audi, you don't really want to lose workers from the workforce. So I think what you need to do is make it clear first that you do expect people to get vaccinated. That should be the default. The burden is on those who don't want to, to say so and to explain why. At NYU, we require people to go through compulsory education, not firing, but we make you go to seminars, try to address your concerns, explain issues like is there uh, meat products or pork products in a vaccine, that sort of thing, to clear away any doubts. We may have religious figures, rabbis, priests, explain why vaccination is a duty, which nearly every religion sees it as. So that education can really help. It is possible sometimes to move workers so that they can mask and still work. It is possible sometimes to accommodate them by taking them into different environments. We even occasionally see some remote work telling people work from home until this is over, but don't disappear on us. So obviously firing, you know, it's a last resort. You don't really wanna do it. You try to accommodate, you try to educate. So given that, uh, what do you think about reports that some hospitals are paying their workers to get vaccinated against COVID-19? This is another really um, it's a great timely question because places are already doing it. I've seen institutions in the Houston, Texas area offering as much as $500 uh, to get vaccinated. I keep thinking, I got to get down there and uh, bring a couple of my pals. That's, that's a very high compensation. I understand why people want to do it, but I think it's a bad idea. I think anti-vaxxers will quickly say, if you have to pay people large amounts of money to get vaccinated, how safe can they be? I think it undercuts trust. It looks like something that might be an incentive, but it can easily be turned on its head. I'm all for giving people some free days off post-vaccination to recover if they get a sore arm or fatigue. I don't think that should be charged against their sick days or family time, that seems reasonable. Occasionally you do see people saying something like, how about a, you know, a, a ticket to get lunch? Uh, we used to do that in the olden days of trying to encourage vaccination, nothing changed there. But big money payouts, I think, are gonna actually undercut trust more than they help. So as we near the end of our conversation, I wanted to get your thoughts about um, 
potential vaccine hesitancy uh, among workers that come from minority populations that have had a history of distrust with the healthcare system. How do you think we should specifically address that important group uh, in the healthcare workforce? Well, there certainly are groups that have higher rates of hesitancy, just in the general population, um, the African-American community, some Native Americans too. Not so much present in the Hispanic uh, community, um, but uh, be that as it may, wherever the resistance is, the first uh, way to cement trust is to admit that there has been problems in the past that have extended right into the present. Occasionally people will say to me, well, African Americans are concerned because they know about the Tuskegee study where cures were deliberately withheld from African American men and they were lied to. And there may be concern about that, but I believe that it's just as concerning to the African American community that they didn't have any health care in their neighborhood yesterday, or that it was hard for them to get uh, primary care uh, accessed in poor neighborhoods. And we should admit that. Somebody may be thinking, yeah, now that you're worried about me giving COVID to you, all of a sudden you're concerned that I get uh, vaccinated. Whereas uh, last year, you didn't care if I couldn't get my medicine or I couldn't get an uh, uh, obstetrician uh, to help my pregnant wife or whatever. So we have to be honest and say, system's been unfair. There have been wrongs, acknowledge that. I think also it's important to say you have greater exposure because of the nature of your work and employment. There are people who go in and clean the uh, ICU and the surgical suites. They're uh, getting exposed more and they need more protection. It's not just me trying to protect myself. It's really trying to protect you. And the third factor is, look, we don't want to be racist. I don't think there's any data that says any ethnic group is more prone to getting COVID. What I think we see is poor people are more prone to getting COVID because they have bad health care. And that turns out frequently to associate or correlate with uh, uh, minority status. It is poverty and we're reaching out, we're making it free. It's a good thing. We acknowledge the fact that poverty drives uh, risk and we're gonna try and do something about it with COVID. So with that, I want to thank uh, Dr. R. Kaplan for sharing his insights with our audience today. Art, thanks again for being a guest on Ethics Talk. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. And thank you for having me again. For more COVID ethics resources, please visit the AMA Journal of Ethics at journalofethics.org. And finally, to our viewing audience, be safe and be well. We'll see you next time on Ethics Talk. <laughs>